Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Robin Craig. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Waller Stegner Center and the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law. Uh, a few announcements before we get going with our main program. There is a sign-up sheet going around. Uh, please sign in. That helps us keep track of who is here uh, and let, lets us know, let you know about future events. Uh, please take a second to silence your cell phone before we get going. And uh, when we get to question and answer, there are microphones up in front. Uh, please use the microphones to ask your questions. We are recording the session, uh, so that not, not only allows the recording to be clear, but also allows everybody else in the room to hear the question. I've got a couple of sponsors to thank. First of all, the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation uh, is sponsoring our guest visit through their Scholar Exchange Grant Program, so we are happy to have him here on that. Uh, but also the University of Utah Credit Union is the general sponsor of the Stegner Center's 2019 to 2020 Green Bag uh, Lecture Series, so thanks to them as well. Uh, a few future events to flag on Wednesday, March 18th, we will have our annual Stegner Lecture. Uh, the speaker will be Jessica Fanzo, who is a distinguished professor of global food and agri uh, agriculture policy at the Johns Hopkins Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. She will be talking on eating our way through the Anthropocene. Uh, Jessica's talk is the unofficial kickoff to the Stegner Center's 25th annual symposium, uh, which will occur Thursday, March 19th, and Friday, March 20th, uh, on food and the environment, resilient and equitable food security in the West. Registration is required and is now available on the Stegner Center website if you want to attend that event. Uh, and then finally, on March 31st, from 4 to 6 p.m., the Wallace Stegner Center, the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, and the Career Development Office here at the College of Law will be sponsoring a video-linked workshop and networking event on the future of fossil fuels in the U.S. energy economy uh, involving speakers across the country joining us by video link. So if you want to participate in that, again, please look on our website. All right, uh, so official announcements uh, now taken care of. I am delighted to welcome our speaker for today, Professor Cliff Villa from the University of New Mexico School of Law. Uh, there he teaches and writes in the fields of constitutional rights, environmental law, and environmental justice. Uh, prior to joining the law school faculty in 2015, uh, Cliff worked for 22 years for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, first with EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and then in, at EPA's regional offices in Denver and Seattle. He focused on cleanup of contaminated sites and enforcement of federal laws like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. He also served for eight years as the on-call legal counsel uh, for EPA's Region 10's emergency response team, providing direct legal support for when things went catastrophically wrong, as in the subject of his talk for today on the Gold King mine spill. Uh, he has a textbook on a practical introduction to environmental law uh, and a forthcoming book on environmental justice. His latest article on the Gold King Mine Spill was published by our law review, so we are very happy about that. Uh, Cliff was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, graduated summa cum laude from the University of New Mexico, and received his JD uh, three years before I did at the Lewis and Clark School of Law in Portland, Oregon. We figured out we just missed each other. Uh, so without further ado, I am pleased to welcome Professor Cliff Villa to talk to us about the Gold King Mine Spill from both the EPA sort of perspective and from an academic perspective. Okay, mic check? Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, um, 
University of Utah College of Law. I'm just so happy to be here, and if that seems like a, a cliche, I am genuinely thrilled to be here in your lovely school. I got to see a, a tour early today, and I've heard a lot about it so much. I was thrilled to have my article published by the University of Utah, and I'm delighted to talk more about it um, today. So I should have tried out the clicker in advance. I'm sure that everything is in good order. Um, many of you may remember some of the story here. You might have seen some of these images of the great glowing orange river, um, and I did as well. Is this a startup? Um, it was interesting timing when this accident happened. I had just left the US EPA and in Seattle and moved home to New Mexico, and it felt like this environmental disaster sort of followed me home. I was in a position to sort of know what should be happening inside the agency, but what I read about this incident seemed very uh, disturbing in many ways. Um, there's sort of a dominant narrative about the Gold King mine that as I began doing some research into what really happened, my, my ideas about it sort of began to change. I've got a lot of slides, uh, don't panic. Um, if I talk too fast, um, you could check out the article and find all 400 footnotes and, and, and go over what, what I might have missed or spoke too quickly. Um, but in, in very broad uh, framework for today, I want to talk about four things. Um, I want to talk about what really happened, which is not necessarily what some people may have read about it in the newspaper um, or other sources. Um, and then I want to talk more specifically about why it happened, what caused this, uh, this spill to happen in the first place. And then, because I teach environmental law, um, I want to talk about sort of what are the environmental laws that applied to this spill, um, and how can we resolve some of the questions about it. There is still ongoing litigation. I'll touch on that a little bit. And then, of course, I want to talk about what's next, which includes not only litigation, but how do we fix this bigger problem, not just about this spill on one day, but the broader problem of mining contamination in this area and, in fact, throughout the West. So what happened may not necessarily be what you heard about, at least saw on the front page of the newspaper. I think many people will, will generally recognize some of this, uh, this geography, the Four Corners area. Do I have a pointer on here? Um, you may see in the, uh, in the upper right corner there, the San Juan Mountains of southwestern Colorado. The spill goes down into the Animas River. It travels down through Silverton and Durango, Colorado. It crosses into the state of New Mexico. It actually swings back up into a piece of Colorado, into Utah, and eventually to end up in Lake Powell. I don't seem to be uh, clicking here. Um, oh, I need a point this way? Okay, I bet I have an arrow. No, it seems I might be locked up entirely. Can I just use the arrow button? That seemed to be locked as well. It's okay. This is nothing like the Gold King mine spill. It's just a, a minor technological challenge. Um, what happened? What happened is going to be a very interesting story, I, I, I promise you. Well, here's a piece of advice. Students, if you ever use technology in the courtroom, something will go wrong. So be ready for it. I had a complete technology, technology failure in the courtroom one time. Um, and I couldn't do the presentation I was about to show the judge. So there's one most important person in the courtroom, which is the judge. Um, I asked permission to approach the bench. I gave him my laptop. I stood over his shoulder and I tapped that arrow key and, uh, and everything worked. Now I would invite all of you to come up with me and, and check out the screen here. Um, but we need, might have enough space, but I hope we won't have to do that. So. Um, just stand by and we'll get this squared away. Let me tell you a story while we work this out. 
So mining contamination is a big problem in the West. That's not news. Um, the Gold King Mine is one of dozens of mines in this mining district known as the Bonita Peak Mining District. Um, there's been a lot of mining that happened historically, but around 1990, people started to realize that the Gold King Mine, among all these other mines, was a significant contributor of mining contamination to this watershed. In August of 2004, EPA Region 8 out of Denver, Colorado, began to do some work to investigate the Gold King Mine. And, all right, we're back up. And is the remote working? Yes, of course. There it is. Um, so, there's a long history of mining in this, in this area. Mining in this very district goes all the way back to the year 1872. In fact, the town of Silverton, Colorado, depended on the discovery of silver, later gold and copper and zinc. Um, by 1890, there's 176 mines and 13 active mills in the area. And by 1902, this area is already contaminated. In fact, the Animas River is so contaminated that the city of Durango decided they could no longer use the Animas River for a drinking water source, and they had to pump their water from another side of the mountain. So 1902, we're dealing with a very contaminated place. Um, the mining activity in this district peaked in the year 1907. By the, year ni by the 1920s, mining was mostly um, phased out, and in fact, in the year 1991, the last operating mine, known as the Sunnyside, shut down. This is the Gold King Mine in, uh, in 1906. Notice a couple of things here. It's a very steep topography. You see that? Um, there's a hotel here that is eventually wiped out by an avalanche. You can also see a stream of mine drainage. You see the shiny line coming out of there? Um, active mine drainage happening in 1906. And you might see a great big pile of waste. The way they did the mining was they sort of tunnel into the mountainside and they scoop out all the, you know, rock and earth and just sort of push it down the slope. And so this pile of mine waste actually becomes a very important feature in the story of the Gold King mine spill. So jump forward to the year 2015, August 2015. Um, EPA knows this is a big contributor of metals and acid mine drainage to the watershed of the Animas River. This is August 4. Part of the problem, the challenge is that because of the steep slope, there's a lot of landslides happening here. You can't even find the opening to the mine portal. You have to sort of clear off a lot of this material in order to find the opening of the mine to begin to investigate it, opening it very carefully because they suspect that there may be water in that mine. And in fact, indeed, there are. The next day, the next morning, while the backhoe is still finishing this clearing operation to find the mine opening, they see this, a clear spurt of water. Can you see that coming up from, from what they thought was the, uh, the bottom of the excavation? That's not a good sign. Um, at this moment, the EP on-scene coordinator had the wisdom to pull everyone back because they knew what was just about to happen. This is the blowout of the Gold King Mine that actually did happen just a couple of minutes later. Luckily, no one was killed, but it wiped out a road, it wiped out a car, and it, it began a, a series of events that we're still going to be talking about for a very long time. They had construction crews on site, and actually within two hours, this is that same Gold King Mine opening, they created a berm to begin channeling some of that contaminated water so it wasn't running straight into the, the creek down below. Um, they gave it a place to, uh, to go to begin collecting some of these contaminated sediments. But it took a very long time then for that great orange plume to move down the watershed. Um, this is another view of, of what we're talking about. So Silverton and Durango are up here. Aspect is an aircraft owned by the US EPA. And they flew back and forth over this, this geography, tracking the movement of the plume. And they could see exactly where it was at any moment. It hit Durango, Colorado at night, so nobody could see that. Um, it crossed into the state of New Mexico two days later on August 7th at 2.16 p.m. Um, the next day, it entered the Navajo Nation. Um, it took nine days from the time of the spill to reach Lake Powell. And in that time, a lot of agencies had time to get ahead of the plume and take water samples to know exactly what it was like before the spill so they would know exactly what happened 
during the spill. It also gave time for agencies to provide warnings to people, to shut off water intakes and other sorts of things. There was a lot of time to go out and, among other things, also take pictures. So this is sort of that iconic photo that um, many people have seen. This was catastrophe on the front page of the, the Durango newspaper. But the very next day, that same picture appears on the front page of the Albuquerque Journal. And three days later, that same picture is there in the New York Times. And this story goes worldwide. The UK is now talking about the Gold King mine spill. All the media are descending upon Durango, Colorado. They want to be a part of the story. And then we began all of these congressional hearings and other sorts of things. This is Gina McCarthy, who was then the administrator of the EPA, who sat through at least six administrative or uh, congressional hearings, one after another after another. Um, here's a field hearing that, uh, that happened in April of the following year. Notice the title of this, Examining EPA's Unacceptable Response to Indian Tribes. That's sort of like the presumption that it was an unacceptable response to the Indian Tribes. The only question is we're going to examine it now and find out exactly how unacceptable it was. Now there's a lot of sort of hyperbole happening here, but there's obviously a lot of very genuine concerns. One thing that we should absolutely pay attention to were concerns expressed by the Navajo Nation at the time, including the president of the Navajo Nation, water is life to many cultures, but especially in this sort of arid environment. Um, there were a lot of real concerns happening here, as well as a lot of sort of um, talk. Here's, what, do they, what do they want? What, if, what would the Navajo Nation want? I sort of dug into that, the testimony there. Compensation for losses. They shut off the water intakes. You might have impacts on agriculture, on livestock. Alternative water supplies, we're not sure if this water is safe to drink or use for any other purpose. They wanted a disaster declaration under federal disaster law. They also wanted a Superfund site listing. And they also wanted something like understanding. Well, the Navajo Nation actually did get a few of these. They did get alternate water supplies, as we'll talk about. They did not get a disaster declaration, um, but they did get a Superfund site listing. And in some way, they got some level of understanding. The EPA administrator actually went out there and offered an apology. You never see any federal administrator go and say, I'm absolutely deeply sorry, but this was a pretty extraordinary case. You saw apologies from the EPA regional office. You saw a lot of apologies. That doesn't fix anything. But sometimes what people really need, among other things, is just acknowledgment. Now, another thing that was happening during all of the congressional hearings and other things was an awful lot of emergency response, a massive emergency response that never got reported anywhere. Um, this guy, um, sort of looking profile this way, um, his name is Greg Weigel. He is an EPA on-scene coordinator out of uh, Boise, Idaho. He is the best of the best. He is the fixer. When he came out here, things started to get much better. They're running operations 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is the Gold King Mine nine days later. Um, they have excavated all of the contaminated material. They have stabilized the entrance that was actively collapsing. They have channeled the water into retention ponds. A lot of things happened very quickly once sort of EPA got into um, the position of responding. Now, they might have been a few days late, obviously, but they finally did mount a major response. There were public meetings, in fact, multiple public meetings every day. And here's just a snapshot of what happened on one day, August 20th. Um, on this day, there were, there's three EPA regions involved, which is sort of another challenging um, element of this. Colorado is EPA Region 8 out of Denver, but New Mexico is EPA Region 6 out of Dallas, and the Navajo Nation is EPA Region 9 out of San Francisco. Um, but they're tracking all the work that they're doing. EPA Region 8 out of Colorado on this day took 15 samples of private drinking water wells. Um, and, uh, and Region 6 took, six took 10 samples of surface water sampling. There's a lot of sampling going on every day. Um, on the same day, EPA Region 8 out of Colorado delivered 53,000 gallons of water. Um, by this time, if you look at livestock agricultural water deliveries, EPA Region 6 had delivered over a million gallons of water for livestock and agriculture. Um, they had also delivered, if you look under agricultural food deliveries, these are bales of hay for livestock, 384 bales of hay that had been delivered. So a lot of things are happening, including water supplies and food for animals. And a lot of people, a lot of people are on site. On this one day, still August 20th, there's 200, 282 
people working in the field from many different agencies, including EPA, but also the US Coast Guard, lots of EPA contractors, and lots of different agencies. EPA, of course, also the US Fish and Wildlife Service, also the US Bureau of Reclamation, and the Colorado Office of Emergency Management, and the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. There is a massive response that is organized um, by, uh, by subject matter, what they need to achieve, and people need to find a way to work together. As the emergency response begins to ramp down at the end of October, there's 44 people left on site. The agencies have already spent $16 million um, on this emergency response. They ultimately spent well over $30 million on the emergency response. And if you want to know what actually happened in terms of the environmental impact, I think the best uh, source of information is probably this peer-reviewed source that came out of EPA's Office of Research and Development. And what they found, here's a few facts. Um, on that day, August 5th, 2015, there was a release of about 5 million gallons of acid mine drainage from the Gold King Mine. Um, those 3 million gallons contained about 540 tons of metals, mostly aluminum and iron. That's where the orange color comes from. Um, but also arsenic and cadmium and copper and mercury and lead and zinc, some toxic metals for sure. Most of the metals came from the waste pile, that big pile of dirt outside of the mine it didn't come from inside the mine. The water blasted outside, went through the waste pile, and that's where it picked up the color. And this is also important. 97% of the metals were in particulate form. That means they're like ground rock, um, the opposite of dissolved metals. Dissolved metals are much more dangerous. They could travel farther in the water. Dissolved metals are the things that poison fish. But ground rock is really not what they call bioavailable. It tends to settle out pretty quickly. Most of it was particulate matter. There were no fish kills. There was a lot of testing. There were a lot of fish put in cages ahead of the plume to see how they would react. And there were no fish kills out of any of that testing, which was largely done by state wildlife agencies. There was no violation of drinking water standards. There were no violation of recreational standards. So the kayakers that we saw in the, in the iconic photo, they were never in danger. There were violations of some water quality standards. There was a spike in metals and water, quality, and water quality violations. But the water quality generally went back to normal within two weeks. Now, normal is not necessarily good because there's a lot of mines that have been draining into this, but they went back to before the spill. Um, there were some elevated levels with spring runoff, but since 2016, metals in the Animas River system have been pretty steady and back to where they were. So, the Gold King Mine is just one mine on this mountain known as Bonita Peak, one of over 40 mining features. Um, and if you could take home one fact to amaze your friends today, um, hang on to this. So 3 million gallons of acid mine drainage released on August 5th of 2015. Because there's so many mines that are also draining in to the same system, every day, there's about 5.4 million gallons of acid mine drainage. There's a, there's a Gold King mine spill happening every single day, even bigger. You just don't see it because it doesn't have the lovely orange color. Um, mining is a very serious problem. It's been a very serious problem. It will remain a serious problem until we get serious about it. So that was sort of what happened. But why did it happen? What, why did it happen at this time on this day well, there was a technical report that was commissioned by the U.S. Bureau of Land Management that actually pretty much got it right, um, has stood the test of time. Here is sort of a, uh, a schematic of EPA's sort of understanding of what was happening inside the Gold King mine. They knew there was water inside the mine tunnel. You see the water? Um, there were landslides which sort of cover the opening of the mine. And the state of Colorado drove two pipes into this mass in 2009. Um, one of the pipes was supposed to be an observation pipe. You could run a camera down and so you could see inside the mine. The other pipe was supposed to be a drain pipe to prevent water from backing up in there. But do you notice where the pipes end up? The pipes didn't actually penetrate the mass. They just went into a wall of dirt. So they never served the function of allowing for observations inside the mine. And in fact, they never allowed the mine to be drained. And so water continued to build up. Now, in order to address this issue, this was the plan. EPA would clear away some of the landslide material. They would insert what's called a stinger pipe down into the mine, 
you hook it up to a pump and a hose, and essentially you suck out the water in the mine, then you can open the mine safely. Um, that was the plan. Obviously, it didn't work. Um, among other things that, that were discovered later was that when people assumed that the mine had water but was not full, it turns out that the mine was not only completely full, but the hydraulic pressure had pushed water up into the pore space of the rock. A tremendous pressure that eventually not only blew out the soft and consolidated metal, but blew out the mine opening. And that was literally the blowout of the Gold King mine. All that hydraulic pressure and all it needed was just a little spark. And you had that massive release of water. Now, a couple years later, I mean, there was lots of postmortems, but one of the most uh, reliable one was done by the Inspector General of EPA. Two years later, when they went back and reviewed all these reports, one of the allegations was, well, you had these EPA operators who didn't know what they were doing. Well, it turns out that the EPA operators were actually some of the most experienced people in the field, specifically in mining engineering, uh, with a combined uh, total of 50 years of experience. One of the allegations was, why didn't EPA like, maybe drill a well from the top down into the mine to, to measure the water level? Um, well, one, there's no specific standards for doing that. But two, the inspector general concluded, which every mining attorney, well, mining engineer will tell you, that each mine is unique. Mining is dangerous. There are lots of unknowns. Um, in fact, the very same EPA on-scene coordinator responsible for the Gold King mine had worked on another mine on the same mountain on the other side of the mountain called the Red and Bonita. And in that case, he did drill a well down into the, into the mine and measure the water level. But the difference was that other mine was lower down on the mountain. You could actually get on top of that mine to drill down. The Gold King mine, remember, is really high elevation. There's no road. There's no safe, to put, safe place to put a drill rig. And at the end of the day, the inspector general found that it was reasonable that EPA did not do that mine testing. And this is a, a conclusion I've never seen from any other inspector general report. We have no recommendations in this report. Um, people fear IG investigations. This is the only one that I ever saw concluding that somebody did not screw up. So even if they didn't screw up, is it possible that there is still liability under environmental statutes? Well, I guess so. Because here is an assertion um, by an expert in environmental law. Now, EPA has violated environmental laws like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, this was not one of the professors here at the University of Utah. This was uh, Representative Rob Bishop, who concluded that EPA had violated these, these environmental laws. So I was interested to know exactly how EPA had envir violated these environmental laws, or if, in fact, EPA did. Um, if you know something about the Endangered Species Act, it sort of begins with the presence of endangered species. And in fact, there are endangered species that are sort of in the general vicinity of Bonita Peak. This is the boreal toad, the southwestern willow flycatcher, the canda lynx. It would be really cool to see a lynx out here, but nobody's ever seen one. Um, in fact, you're not going to see a toad or the willow flycatcher on the side of this mountain at 11,000 feet anyway. But there could be impacts on aquatic species downstream, right? There are many species of threatened and endangered species in the San Juan River, maybe the Animas River, the Razorback Sucker, the Zuni Bluehead Sucker. This is a Colorado Pike Minnow. Yes, that's a minnow um, that also lives in the San Juan River. There could be impacts on endangered or threatened species of fish. But what does the Endangered Species Act actually require? Well, I know this is a huge simple simplification, um, but maybe just two broad things. One, if you're about to take a federal action, thou shalt consult with a wildlife agency to ensure your actions don't jeopardize the species. And two, thou shalt not take. Whoever you are, you shall not take a species as defined. Now, remember, there was never any fish kill. There was never any impact on any animal species. So take was not really an issue. If there was any issue about compliance with the Endangered Species Act, it would probably be what's known as consultation. Each federal agency shall, in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, ensure that any action authorized, funded, or carried out by such agency is not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of the species. It's very clear that the Gold King mine work was indeed authorized, funded, and carried out by the EPA. EPA paid the contractors, and EPA was there observing. It is definitely an action authorized, funded, or carried out. 
And so perhaps there should be this requirement for EPA to consult. But how can you consult on a spill that you never anticipate happening? In fact, there's no reason to believe you spill happens. It's, uh, environmental assessment happens all the time, and nobody stops and spends a year doing the sort of ESA consultation business. Well, one, when this came up at a congressional hearing, the, the head of the Department of Interior said, well, no, I can't say that EPA was in violation of the Endangered Species Act. It's EPA's choice whether or not to do a Section 7 consultation. If EPA guesses wrong, they can be subject to citizen suit, but that hasn't been established. More importantly, there are provisions for consultation even during an emergency. Um, 40, 50 CFR 402.05 has provisions for emergency consultation. Emergency consultation can be things like a phone call, like having someone from the Fish and Wildlife Service sitting next to you in a command post. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. If you saw that list of agencies that I showed earlier, here's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They were right there. I found two wildlife biologists in the Fish and Wildlife Office in Albuquerque who went up to the Gold King Mine spill and walked the length of the plume and were one of the, uh, the, the agencies determined that there was no fish kill. So there's actually real-time consultation that was happening um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Long-term, if there are impacts to fish or other species, that's exactly the sort of thing that the CERCLA process can address. We're going to talk about CERCLA um, in just a moment. But if there's long-term impacts to fish, um, those are sort of things that can and should be studied in consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service going forward. We couldn't say right now, though, that EPA violated the Endangered Species Act um, as an immediate consequence of the spill. Well, what about violations of the Clean Water Act? That was another thing that Congressman Bishop had asserted. Um, here is sort of the basic fundamental idea of the Clean Water Act, except in compliance with a permit, the discharge of any pollutant by any person shall be unlawful. Here is a discharge of a pollutant. They have no permit. This is a discharge of waters in the United States. This is a violation of the Clean Water Act. Well, in response to that, um, the EPA administrator testified before Congress that, well, the law and enforcement distinguishes between the company who makes and releases pollution and the entities who are trying to respond and clean up the pollution. Well, that was the assertion of the EPA administrator, but here is a response of some authors from the Heritage Foundation. They say, no statute makes that distinction between polluters and responders, nor does any federal law establish a responder's defense to environmental liability. Well, is that true? No. No, that's not true. And if any of my 1L law students had written that on an essay, I'd say, go back and read the table of contents to any book of environmental statutes. And they would see that, in fact, there are many provisions that provide distinctions between the polluters and the people who are trying to clean up pollution. Here's one of those provisions that you would find in the table of contents to the, to, uh, the Superfund statute, CERCLA. It's called permit waiver. No federal, state, or local permit shall be required for the portion of any removal or remedial action conducted entirely on site. No permit shall be required. No permit under the Clean Water Act shall be required for removal action. And what was happening at the Gold King Mine that day was very clearly a removal action, and the statute says no permit shall be required. Now, query what it means to conduct something on site, entirely on site, but this is one clear statutory exception for people who are trying to respond to contamination. Here's another one. This is from the regulations implementing the Clean Water Act. Exclusions. The following discharges do not require a permit under the Clean Water Act. Any discharge in compliance with instructions of an on-scene coordinator. The work happening at the Gold King Mine was being done by an on-scene coordinator at the instruction of an on-scene coordinator. <clears throat> no permit under the Clean Water Act should be required. That provision, by the way, hasn't been tested in courts, but many other provisions um, that ex create exclusions for permits have been. Um, and there's no reason to believe that this exclusion, which has been on the books for almost 30 years, would be um, anything other than valid. Maybe, though, there's a violation of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA, a statute that seeks to manage the treatment and disposal of hazardous waste. Um, it's a good statute to apply to 55-gallon drums that are rusting in the rain. Um, unfortunately, RICRA does not apply, at least regulations for hazardous waste, to mining waste. There's a specific exclusion in the RICRA statute known as the Bevel Amendment that creates a specific exclusion from the definition of hazardous waste 
for solid waste from the extraction, beneficiation, and processing of ores and minerals, i.e. mining waste. Mining waste is not something subject to regulations for hazardous waste under RICRA. Now, a bit of a backdoor under RICRA is that there are requirements that could apply not to hazardous waste, but to solid waste. This rock is indeed a solid waste. And if this rock may present an imminent substantial endangerment, then maybe you do have some sort of liability under RICRA. This is actually one of the theories that is being used now to support litigation against the EPA. Not just that it's a solid waste, but a solid waste that may present an insubstantial endangerment. A factual finding, but you know, maybe. The environmental law that is usually most applicable to mining contamination is CERCLA. The Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act better known to many people as Superfund, the Superfund statute. Superfund has explicit jurisdiction over mining contamination, um, and it has a very broad scheme for liability, um, a scheme that everyone has recognized as generally strict liability. If you fall into one of these categories defined by the statute, you are liable. One of those categories is the owner-operator of a facility. On this day, August 5th, 2015, EPA is clearly an operator of a facility. They've got the guy operating the piece of equipment. Um, They're absolutely an operator of a facility. They may, in fact, be a person who, by contract, arranged for disposal. They have a contract with the guy on the bulldozer. Um, EPA could be liable under CERCLA as both an operator and someone who arranged for disposal. But, again, there are exceptions from that liability right there in the CERCLA statute that would appear in the table of contents. This is one of those sections, section 107D, rendering care or advice. No person shall be liable as a direct result of actions taken or omitted at the direction of an on-scene coordinator. Right there in the statute is an exclusion from liability if you're acting at the direction of on-scene coordinator. In fact, there was an on-scene coordinator. Maybe this applies. But it applies in a limited fashion. It's an exception from strict liability, but there could still be liability for negligent conduct or grossly negligent conduct or intentional conduct. It sh sort of shifts the burden. It takes away strict liability, but allows liability for a higher standard of gross negligence or, or negligence. There's an express um, exception of li for liability for response action contractors. No one would agree to take a contract for cleanup if they knew they could be liable. And so CERCLA right there um, has an express um, relief from liability for people who are implementing these cleanup contracts. And it's not just contractors. Um, it could be many other parties as well. Again, that's limited. They can lose their protection if they act with negligence or gross negligence. Same thing for state employees. The state of Colorado or Utah DEQ is not strictly liability. They're not liable unless they're negligent or grossly negligent. Um, same thing with municipalities and tribes. So are, there are protections not just for EPA, but for states and for tribes and for local agencies as well when they are engaged in these sort of cleanup processes. Now, moving beyond environmental statutes, there might be liability under other federal statutes like the Federal Tort Claims Act. This is sort of a general waiver of, of the federal government's sovereign immunity. The United States shall be liable for tort claims in the same manner to the same extent as private individuals under like circumstances. But you must first exhaust your administrative remedies. Don't read all this. Um, you must present your claim first to the agency to see if they will pay it. If they don't pay it, then and only then can you file your claim in federal court. Now, in fact, many of the agencies, like the New Mexico Environment Department, the Navajo Nation, did present claims for payment to the EPA. A lot of rafting companies and fly, fly fishing guides and others presented claims. In fact, EPA went around handing out copies of Standard Form 95. Fill in this form, state your claim, state your request for funding. We will present this to EPA headquarters. We should be able to write you a check. That was sort of what everybody assumed. But sort of to everybody's surprise, those claims were denied by some claims officer in EPA headquarters. Um, blanket across the board denied all those claims under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Why did they deny all these claims? Well, there is an exception under the Federal Tort Claims Act for what are known as discretionary functions. If it's an action that the agency doesn't have to take, it's just doing it from the goodness of its heart, um, there may be a limitation on liability for discretionary actions. Now, I think that's wrong. 
that the agency decided not to pay this. It says not just EPA, but guided by the U.S. Department of Justice. And the U.S. Department of Justice can be very conservative, and they're always afraid of precedent or other sorts of things. Um, but EPA could have just paid all these claims and been done with it. Um, and I think, you know, practically they probably should have just paid those claims a long time ago. Um, when I'm appointed EPA administrator for the day, I will pay those claims. Um, but until that happens, we might have litigation. Okay, well, another big sort of suggestion we had from Rob Bishops, another, um, was that these guys should go to jail. Whoever's responsible here, if an individual or private company had done this, the EPA would have made sure there was hell to pay. And as an EPA attorney, I probably would have been that guy making sure that there was hell to pay. But there was a difference. If it was a mining company that was just randomly poking holes in a mountain and caused a spill, absolutely. But this was not a Sarko randomly poking holes in, in the mountain. These were people who were there because they knew the mine was draining, acid mine drainage, and were trying to find a way to deal with it in some way. There are, in fact, criminal penalties under the environmental statutes. Um, if you have an unpermitted take under the Endangered Species Act, possible 12 months, it's still only a misdemeanor, but you can go to jail for 12 months for taking that boreal toad. You go to jail for 12 months for a negligent discharge under the Clean Water Act. You can go to jail for two years for knowing disposal under RCRA. You can go to jail for 15 years for knowing endangerment under the Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act. But the thing is that in order to go to jail or even to have a criminal indictment or even get the attention of a criminal prosecutor, you need more than simply a violation of the statute. You need, you need something more. We'll talk about that. And I just want to say that I spent most of my EPA career actually pursuing a lot of federal agencies. The U.S. Navy, the U.S. Department of Energy created bigger messes than anybody else, for sure, without question. Um, this is a case, one of my favorite cases to talk about in class, U.S. versus D. Lentz and Gep. D. Lentz and Gep are literally rocket scientists at Aberdeen Proving Grounds who create a horrible mess. They were tried and convicted for violations under RCRA, and those convictions withstood under appeal. Smartest guys in the room, the dumbest guys for management of hazardous waste. <clears throat> but Delance and Gap were different because they created a waste. They had no deniability. There were fish kills from the Delance and Gap case. In order to attract the attention of criminal prosecution, EPA and the Department of Justice have had two long-standing criteria for what is a good case for criminal prosecution. And there's two criteria not just violating the statute, but a violation that results in significant environmental harm, like a fish kill, like children in the hospital, and evidence of culpable conduct, knowingness, among other sorts of things. And these two criteria for criminal prosecution have actually been studied and established through empirical studies of which are the cases that have actually been indicted, tried, and convicted. Um, there's a professor at the University of Michigan, David Ullman, who's looked at all criminal environmental enforcement cases. Um, the biggest indicator for criminal prosecution, repetitive violations. This was not their first time. It was the second, it was the third, it was the fourth. It's an indication that they know that they're in violation and they keep doing it. Another one is deceptive or misleading conduct. Somebody forged a document, right? Somebody falsified some sort of reporting requirement evidence of culpable conduct. In the case of the Gold King Mine, there was none of that. There was no forgery of documents. This was not a multiple sort of violation. It was no surprise when the U.S. attorney investigated this complaint and decided not to file any charges to seek any kind of prosecution. So what's next? Well, two things. One, there's still a big contaminated site that needs to be fixed up. Um, in 1992, in fact, the EPA knew that this area of the, the Animus Robbershed was so contaminated that they had proposed it for the national priorities list. They proposed it for designation as a Superfund site. It was not designated in 1992, largely because local communities objected to the designation. They fear things like Superfund stigma or what this means on their, their, their tourist industry. After the Gold King mine spill, local communities dropped their objections. Um, the town of Silverton, San Juan County, both signed letters supporting the Superfund designation of this area. And in fact, on September 6, 2016, we had a new Superfund site known as the Bonita Peak Mining District 
Superfund site. That includes the Gold King Mine and 40 other mining features in this area. So we have a new Superfund site. We're going to follow the Superfund process. We're going to continue doing small sort of removal actions. We're going to do a remedial investigation to study the extent of contamination, a feasibility study to start thinking about engineering solutions for it. We're going to sign some kind of record or decision to select a remedy that might come out later this summer, the first one. We're going to look for um, potentially responsible parties who is responsible for this. There's already been one administrative order issued to one of the mining companies who EPA thinks is responsible. There's going to be negotiations. There's going to be settlements. There's going to be consent decrees entered in court. And eventually, someday, there's going to be a massive remedial action on the order of $500 million. This is not unrealistic. A massive construction project that will go on for decades to fix this. Right now, there's also massive litigation. Um, in May 2016, the state of New Mexico filed a complaint against the US EPA and its contractors and mining companies. In August, the Navajo Nation filed a complaint against EPA and contractors and other mining companies. The state of Utah was a little late in the game, but they eventually filed a complaint in July of 2017. Um, they sued the mining companies, they eventually amended their complaint, and they are now suing the EPA as well. And then there's a series of um, private tort claims that have been filed. In August of 2017, there were claims filed by what are known as the McDaniel uh, plaintiffs. They are people who live along the Animas River in Aztec, New Mexico, right below the Colorado line. And a year later, the biggest tort claim was filed by members of the Navajo Nation, 195 members of the Navajo Nation known as the Allen plaintiffs. And all this litigation has been consolidated in the U.S. District Court of New Mexico, over the objection, by the way, of the state of Utah and everybody else who is not in New Mexico. Um, so we should have a lot of activity in, uh, in the District Court in New Mexico in downtown Albuquerque. Now, just this morning, I received the, uh, the scheduling order for this litigation. Um, they've been doing all those things that students might have studied in, in, for discovery and civil procedure, interrogatories and requests for, deposition, uh, requests for uh, admissions next month. They should begin a series of, of depositions. Um, they have a schedule for completing uh, fact discovery by August of this year. Um, they have a schedule for settlement conferences in October of November later this year. Uh, my bet is that there will be settlements. What do they want? What do they want? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different parties, right? There are government entities like the Navajo Nation and the state of New Mexico, and they have a lot of private plaintiffs. Um, one thing they all seem to want is injunctive relief. We want to fix this problem. Um, I think this is unlikely as a form of relief because that's sort of what the Superfund process is about. There's a process for how you select remedies, and it's not usually that a federal judge dreams it up. But you can't tell a federal judge what to do, so you know I could be wrong. Um, what else do they want? They want response costs. If the state of New Mexico or the state of Utah spent money investigating or cleaning up on its, on its uh, jurisdiction, they should absolutely recover those response costs. They want compensatory damages. If you had curtailed your livestock feeding operations on the Navajo Nation and incurred some sort of financial loss, you should be able to recover those costs. I think that's pretty likely to, uh, to, um, to find some sort of a solution as well. And parties are also seeking punitive damages, which I think is a little less likely. In the end, I think that there will be settlements. Um, I'm told that the state of Utah is very interesting, interested in settling its own claims right now. Um, I wish that this case had settled a long time ago. Uh, there is a trial that is scheduled for August of 2021. Um, we'll see if any of that trial schedule stands. But there's a lot of discovery and a lot of litigation. You're going to be hearing a lot about that. But also understand there's a lot of work to investigate the contamination and a lot of work that hopefully the communities will be involved in in developing the appropriate cleanup. So um, I'm interested in all of this as a former EPA person. I'm, I'm critical as an academic on what is happening and also what is being reported, but I'm also a big fan of this area. Um, I love the Animas River. I spent a lot of time as a kid in Durango and fishing the San Juan River, um, and I love nothing more than a healthy ecosystem as well. So um, that's all I have for you, and I would love to entertain any questions. Thank you. Questions, questions. And please remember to use the microphone for questions. Uh, I have 
one question. You talked about how a lot of the statutes protect uh, folks who are cleaning up. Mm -hmm. And so one question I have relates to um, Good Samaritan laws that we've never been able to pass in this country. Yeah. Um, I, my impression is that a lot of the reason that mining companies are not out there cleaning up uh, things that are legacy that are not theirs is because there's no protection for them. That's mm -hmm. what I've always been told. So if the statutes are so clear that those who are cleaning up are not liable, why aren't they cleaning up and are Good Samaritan laws necessary? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so I've actually spent a lot of time studying the concept of Good Samaritan law. So the general concept is that if you're not already liable, but you are doing something voluntarily, you are that Good Samaritan, you should not be liable for things that go wrong during that, that cleanup action. Um, one answer is there is already a Good Samaritan provision in the Superfund statute. It's section 107D. Under 107D, an on-scene coordinator can direct anyone it could be a contractor, it could be a state, but it could also be a Sarco Mining um, to do work. And then they would be protected within the scope of the thing that they were ordered to do. Um, as an EP attorney, I actually negotiated an agreement with the Sarco Mining um, to do some wetlands restoration. They wanted to do some pilot testing of how a wetlands uh, cleanup project would work. And at EPA, we want to sort of give them the flexibility to do that. And so we negotiated an, an administrative agreement on consent that said, do this and you will only be liable if you screw this up, but you won't be liable for the rest of the, the cleanup. So EPA can and does negotiate site-specific agreements with parties to do Good Samaritan work. Now, it may, there may be some administrative costs because EPA can't negotiate an agreement with everybody. And so some people have wanted a statutory fix here, that anybody could do this. The problem with that, though, is that you really need to be careful about how you um, couch the protection. One of the real concerns with Good Samaritan laws is that you may not be dealing with really good Samaritans, but you may be dealing with, for example, a shell corporation that wants to do something, but they know that they're already liable, and so they create some LLC to do that which they couldn't do directly because they're a liable party. I spent a lot of time developing, and you could find on the EPA's website today, a website for Good Samaritan policies. And there's a model Good Samaritan agreement, there's a Good Samaritan policy, but a lot of it talks about how to define what is a bona fide Good Samaritan. How do you determine like, the truly Good Samaritan versus a shell corporation that's trying to do something without liability? There's been a lot of proposals for a Good Samaritan amendment to the Clean Water Act. Um, and it's come up again and again. Um, you know, I, it, it could do some good, but as soon as you begin to open some environmental law statutes, there's also some potential downsides. I would say if you're concerned about liability under the Clean Water Act, again, I suspect that EPA could negotiate some sort of agreement to provide some liability protection without amending the statute. If the statute is amended someday, there would be challenges about how to implement it, but it could help. Another sort of practical matter is who has money to do Good Samaritan work? It's probably not the Boy Scouts, maybe someone like Trout Unlimited, but the people who have money to do this sort of work are probably either the people who are responsible for the contamination or maybe some super loaded developer that doesn't need to work so much. Um, but it could, be a, it could be a fix. There's a lot of mining and there's probably a lot of solutions that need to be done. So thank you for the question. Um, more questions? So from your experience, how often are Superfund site designations actually effective at cleaning up a site? In my experience, very. I would commend to you a, uh, another law review article called Superfund versus Megasites. Um, that was sort of an experience of EPA Region 10's work in uh, cleaning up mining contamination in northern Idaho. Um, in, in, in Idaho, and sort of like the Animus Basin, there were proposals for Superfund listings in the early 1990s, and EPA was very reticent to do that because of community opposition. Uh, I think really if the Bonita Peak had been listed as a Superfund site in 1992, the Gold King Mine blowout wouldn't have happened. It, it would not have filled as it did, and they could have stopped it before the disaster began. Um, in the case of Idaho, um, when EPA finally got serious about cleaning up the Coeur d'Alene Basin, there was a lot of, of community opposition. We had death threats pretty regularly. Um, but 
over 10 years, people start to get used to the idea that, among other things, Superfund is a huge jobs program. I mean, these are real jobs in construction and engineering that don't always require a, a, a college degree, and people like to take ownership of their own community, um, and it can really turn things around. We sort of need to get over the fear of, of Superfund stigma. And there's a lot of economic studies that say, yes, it can have an effect on property values initially, and it can also have a very substantial positive effect when things get cleaned up. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just one thing that people have to consider. The, the, big, the big advantage of Superfund listing is it means there's an access to a Superfund trust fund um, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. And that injection of federal money has a multiplier effect like almost nothing else. Um, so it has the economic upside and it gets things done and a lot of good things can come from it. More questions? I'm interested in the uh, in any after action reports about why the water pressure was so great. Mm -hmm. If there were mines in lower elevation that had been sealed, did that contribute to it? I mean, what was what was found? Yes, that's an excellent question. So the uh, the hydraulics of Bonita Peak were really interesting, and I, I think your question sort of suggests some solution. Um, there was a very brief mention of the Sunnyside mine. There was a tunnel that went underneath the mountain. And in the early 1990s, um, people thought it was a good idea to plug up the tunnel because it was discharging acid mine drainage into the river system. What happens when you plug the, uh, the mine tunnel is that it the mountain itself began to fill up like a bathtub. Um, and so the Gold King mine didn't have water in it in the 1990s. But when you plugged up the, the drainage, the mountain and the mining works began to fill up. And that's why the mine at, at 11,000 feet begins draining. There wasn't water there before, um, but there was a lot of snow, right, in the high country. That snow would percolate into the mining workings, and if they couldn't drain out, the water just began to fill. Um, a lot of people have told me they knew it was a mistake at the time to start plugging those, those drains. Um, there wouldn't have not have been a blowout but for the plug. But it sort of seemed to make sense at the time. Like, if you want to stop a discharge, what do you do? You put a wall of concrete there. The thing about water, in, though, is that it finds another way out. And that's exactly what happened. So we learn a lot about, about those things. Now they actually do put plugs in mines, but they usually have them on some sort of rotation system where they could drain them or control the drainage. You don't simply stop water. You redirect water is sort of what people have learned. Good question. More? I have uh, another super fun sort of question. So I know um, Circle provides for pretty aggressive pursuit of potentially responsive, responsible parties. Um, and I'm just wondering, like in this case, so most of these mines were, were used and abandoned more than 100 years ago, mm -hmm. and the last one was used in 1970, was it? Yeah, um, 1990 was the last one that was closed. And, and so I'm just wondering, you have all these old mining companies, which are presumably either dissolved or have been absorbed by other companies. So I guess my question is, how far, how far back are we going to hold successors and interest liable for their predecessors' actions? Mm -hmm. And if we are going to go back a long ways, is it, in your opinion, is it easy for the modern consolidated mining companies to sort of try to avoid liability by playing sort of the corporate shell game and, and that sort of thing? Yeah. Those are, those are good questions. There's more than one question in there. But um, one thing to know about CERCLA is it is inherently a retroactive statute. It was passed in 1980 not to prevent future Superfund stat sites, but mostly to address past contaminated sites like Love Canal in upstate New York. And so it really was directed at cleaning up things that had already been contaminated and holding those parties liable. How far back? 100 years is not at all unrealistic. Um, I helped to try the case against Sarco and Hecla um, in northern Idaho, and we used a lot of documents going back into the 1880s. Um, what you find is there is not just that things happen, and if a company is gone, it's gone, but a lot of times you do find corporate successors that may have value in the company. Um, what do mining companies have that might be valuable? Minerals, right? Um, it turns out that Asarco, a bankrupt company, had a fortune in silver holdings in Mexico. Um, and, um, and also, 
uh, you may just find that there may be insurance policies. There's a whole industry of insurance archaeology. There may have been policies in place at the time that also have very significant value today before people started to create like pollution exclusions in insurance policies. Also, you may find even if a company doesn't have any money at all, they may actually have some very valuable asset, like simply real estate. This is the perfect place to put a mine waste repository, or this is a perfect corridor for access for construction trucks, or something of value that they can contribute. Um, so while a company may look like it doesn't have liquid assets today, it may actually have some very valuable assets that could contribute to cleanup. Now, in the Coeur d'Alene Basin, we investigated over 100 parties, and I'd say 90% of them were just gone. And if they're gone, they're gone. That's OK. But we ended up getting over a half a billion dollars out of companies that looked bankrupt because they had assets that were, are contributing to cleanup today. What does this mean for future? You know, if you're going to invest now, you need to be very careful about maintaining the corporate form. And companies are much smarter about that today. But they do that because they know they could be liable if they, they screw up. More, more questions? Yes, follow up or something crazy? In response to that question also, um, current mining companies that buy mining companies, older mining companies, are totally on the hook. Uh, and there's no question about that. My company that I used to work for uh, had at one point purchased Homestake Mining Company, which has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. loads of Superfund liability. And so if you're at a, a company and you're considering buying up the assets of another company, you definitely are thinking about the liability, the potential liability associated with that purchase. And I, I don't know if your experience is that there is shell games and people are trying to get out of that kind of liability, but I've definitely seen uh, that we hired an attorney who was a super fun expert because of all of the historic uh, liability from the mergers over the years. Right. Due diligence becomes very important. Everybody should go into any transaction knowing exactly what they'll get out of it. There's a few experiences where that has not happened. Um, a company named Arco, for some reason, purchased a bunch of mining contaminated property in, in, in Montana and ended up with a billion dollars of liability. Um, that would never happen, and that's certainly not going to happen with any student you know, who graduates from this law school. Um, but you need to be careful. So those are good lessons. Do we have time for a last question, or where are we? Okay, good. Sir, you look like you have a question. No? <laughs> yes? Are the mining companies sweating it in connection with the animus, or is this mostly a PR disaster for the public agencies? That's a good question. Um, there are mining companies who are doing work right now under administrative order from EPA. Those same companies are also challenging their liability. Um, but they sort of know that if they don't respond to an order at all, there are penalties for that. And so any savvy company is not going to just say, no way. Um, they're going to try to negotiate some sort of schedule to sort of um, extend the work that they need to do and manage that sort of work. Um, very few companies that, that I know, if, if they've got legal counsel, would just not respond at all. Um, I don't know where the status of the, the search for other potential responsible parties lies, but my bet is that there's people at EPA and DOJ looking at all the insurance policies and mapping out all the, the corporate histories, and there's probably a lot more value there than, than is immediately apparent. And then eventually the mining companies will, will sue each other, and they'll work something out. More? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. If you'd like a copy with 400 footnotes, please uh, please come see me afterward.